Hey there, welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is a show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. It's brought to you by FunkinStuff.net, and I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the first guide of funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did, and I'll be thankful, of course, too. It's a great gift. Share it. It's a great fun time for everybody. Whether you're watching or listening to the podcast version, I thank you as always for your continued interest and support in this program. Speaking of which, if you haven't already done so, make sure to subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. You'll get the show before anyone else does. You'll get special goodies. You'll be on the inside, if you will. Uh, also, we need that support. Support the show support the musicians that it promotes and the legacies that it preserves. Thank you so much. This episode features Harry Elston, co-founder and lead vocalist of the sunshiny late 1960s and early 1970s pop soul singing quartet, the Friends of Distinction. Formed in 1968, the Los Angeles-based Friends of Distinction originally also included Floyd Butler, who passed away in 1990 and Jessica Cleves, who passed away in 2014, and also the fourth member was Barbara Jean Love. Prior to that, Elston and Butler were members of the Hi-Fi's, which also included future Fifth Dimension singers, Marilyn McCoo and Lamont McLemore. And together, they worked with Ray Charles. The Friends of Distinction were discovered by football legend Jim Brown and helped them get signed to RCA Records. The Friends came storming out of the gate with the smash crossover hit, Grazing in the Grass, which was an Elston written and sung vocal cover version of an instrumental hit by Hugh Masekela. That song went to top five on both the pop and soul charts, and its album, Grazing, hit number 10 on the R&B chart. Within about a year, the number 14 album, Highly Distinct, and number nine, Real Friends followed along with the additional hits Going in Circles, which went to number three on the R&B chart, Love or Let Me Be Lonely, which hit number six pop, and Time Wait for no, uh, Time Waits for No One. Love or Let Me Be Lonely featured Charlene Gibson, who filled in during Love's pregnancy. The Friends of Distinction went on to release four more albums, Whatever, Friends and People, Love Can Make It Easier, Revive, Revive Essence, <laughs> Revive of Essence, I think that's how you say it, Live to Light Again. That title might have hurt that one, if I'm being totally honest. That one was the last one before they called it quits in 1976. The last couple of records failed to even enter the charts. Cleese went on to sing with Earth, Wind & Fire and later Parliament Funkadelic. Up until a quarter, uh, actually up until a couple of years ago, Elston continued to perform here and there. In this in-depth interview, Elston shares scores of special memories surrounding the Friends of Distinction start, their rocket ride to stardom, their golden recordings, television and stage performing memories, and eventually being cast aside as a casualty of record company politics. Along the way are intimate reflections on icons like Jim Brown and Ray Charles. So let's check in with Harry Elston, who after all these years is still grazing in the grass as the Friends of Distinction's catchy tracks and impeccable harmonies continue to have so many fans digging in their sound a half century later. And I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, Harry Elston, a founding member of the fabulous late 1960s and early 1970s pop soul singing quartet, the Friends of Distinction. Hey, hey, Harry. hey, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. Good to have you. Nice to see you. So you're you're coming to us from where today? Uh, Lake Balboa, California, where the sun is shining and the rain has subsided to a bit. Okay. And then San Fernando Valley. Yeah. Keeping, yeah. The, uh, keeping the mudslides away? <laughs> yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. <laughs> Good. Well, as you know, I used to live out there, so I'm all too uh, used to that whole thing of the fires, the mudslides. You know. Okay, okay, you feel me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, great to have you. Glad we could connect. And um, you know, 
We're going to uh, test your memory banks today. I hope that's okay. That's cool. Hey, but I just noticed something. That hat you got on. Uh-huh. You go, boy. <laughs> it's Lakers, right? That's right. That's right. I'm from L.A. All right, man. Right on. Right on. We, we, we grooving right now. Yeah. We're bringing Showtime back. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know something? I was there at Showtime when they were when they, at the Showtime players. Magic Johnson was part of our – we had a company called the Magic Cookie Company. So I would be downstairs waiting for them to go, and I would see Kareem and Magic and, you know, wave at them a little bit. But I was there at Showtime. Wow. Yeah. Those were great years. I, I was at the uh, game six of the uh, final series with the 76ers. Okay. That was great. Dr. Yeah, J. Yeah, all yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So good to have him back. I'm not sure about LeBron, but it's good to be winning again. Yep, yep. He'll be okay. He'll be all right. <laughs> all right, Harry. Um, well, I want to go way, way back and find out where you uh, came from and, you know, how you first got exposed to music. Were you in a musical household? Did you, did you have siblings that were musical? How'd you get started? Okay. Uh, and sometimes this happens. I, 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 I skip around a little bit because we're going way back. <laughs> but I'm from, I'm from San Diego, California. I was born in Dallas. And then my, my uh, family migrated to San Diego. I was about two and a half or three. So I grew up in San Diego, went to Point Loma High School, graduated from Lincoln High School. Lincoln High School with Marcus Allen and Terrell Davis. Mm -hmm. but my brother and I, we played football too, so we sort of laid a little groundwork. And, uh, you know, that's, that's great that they came by. I see Marcus every now and then, you know, but Lincoln High School in San Diego. Now, while I was there, we always did doo-wop. We always sang on street corners and stuff, and we had a we had a group in high school and stuff like that. And I sang in the octet, uh, acapella octet. That was hard, some hard stuff, you know, singing them notes and, and with eight people with no music. But I learned, you know, my ear got got good. Then, um, you ever heard of Johnny Otis? Remember Johnny Otis? Mm -hmm. Well, Johnny Otis would come to town and he'd have this talent show. And our group was called Cell Foster and the Audios which is on YouTube. I, I found the records on YouTube. So we won, we won the talent contest. We went on tour with, with uh, Johnny Otis Caravan, with Etta James and Big J McNeely and Jackie Kelso and those people. And we also recorded on his label. So I was like 15 and 16, man, doing, you know, traveling up to LA, doing concerts and stuff like that. So basically like uh, we did the, the Soul Foster thing. Then I graduated from high school and I went in the Air Force. Did a little singing in the Air Force. Then when I got out of the Air Force, uh, I stayed up in Northern California. I was stationed at Travis Air Force Base. And my mother and my stepfather were living in Oakland, East Oakland. So I hung there for a couple of years. Then I came back to L.A. Uh, looking for a job. And uh, I came there, back to L.A. to play baseball. I tried out for the Los Angeles Angels. Mm. So, uh, I, you know, I did okay. I, did, I made the first cut. But to be perfectly honest, it wasn't ready for a whole bunch of brothers back then when I came down there. So, you know, I had to roll with the punches. But at least I had an option, you know, music or, or baseball. So when the baseball thing didn't happen. Then, what uh, position did you play? I played shortstop and second base. You know, I had a little arm, you know. I, I, was, I was all right. You know, I had making the first cut back then. That was great. And um, so we got up here, got to L.A., me and my, my, my roommate, you know, we moved in. I couldn't get, I couldn't find a job, man. I finally got a job working for Kaiser Permanente. So, you know, we used to, I got into the loop around LA uh, and uh, I used to go to these house parties. And when you go to a house party, you know, you do what? You know, hey man, you sing? Yeah, yeah, man, let's go outside. You go out in the car and, and drink a little bit and, and sing a little bit. So I met Lamont McLemore. Hmm. Lamont sings with the Fifth Dimension. Now, but then we were just we were just hanging, hanging buddies. And we had this group um, called the High Fives slash vocals. Now the High Fives, Marilyn McCool was in the High Fives, mm -hmm. Lamont McLemore, Clarence McDonald, Fritz Baskin, Larry Summers, Rex Middleton. So we used to sing jazz, nothing but jazz. And um, 
they would when when big jazz artists would come to 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 Los Angeles to perform at various clubs, they would come to this after hours place called the Adams West, and later named the Kabuki Theater. So we were like the house vocal group there because we we sang jazz and all these jazzers came. So that was that was great. And uh, so we did the high five thing. We went on the ray, on the road with Ray Charles. We recorded on Ray's label a song called Lonesome Mood. And Ray changed our name from a high five to the vocals then, the vocals. So that's that's what we were. And we did that for a bit. And uh, as groups have it, you know, you split up, go different directions. So they went on to perform the fifth dimension. And Floyd Butler and myself, we went on to form the Friends of Distinction. All right. Well, let me uh, interject there. You covered a lot of uh, history there. Um, I know, I know. It's as if you've told it before. <laughs> yeah, you reckon? <laughs> um, so what what was Ray Charles like? Let's just start there. Ray Charles, hey, man, I was so excited. We all were excited. And uh, and you got to remember, we're talking early 60s, mid-60s. So a lot of things was going on. You know, Ray was into his habits and and. You know, we had to adjust. We were young. Marilyn was like 18. Fritzy, the other girl was about 16. You know, we're, we're, we were early 20s and stuff. But Ray was, he always respected us. He treated us with respect. And he, he respected our music. That's what really, you know, you know, was, was cool. Because we had Rex Middleton. It was Rex Middleton in the high five. But Rex was older than us. And he had had a high five group before us. But he taught us how to sing. So we had to carry ourselves a certain way. I got a picture I posted the other, other week about us, but with Ray Charles' plane, I posted on Facebook. The plane was called the Buzzer. So you had assigned seats on the plane. You had the pilot on the left, the co-pilot on the right, Ray in the middle. Now, I did not feel comfortable if I didn't see Mr. C, we call him Mr. C. If Mr. C wasn't up there doing his, he had his job. You could see him from your seat, you know. Okay. And he's let's get this mother off the ground, <laughs> and we take off, man. We we went all over the all the United States and stuff in the buzzer. So the experience with Ray was was wonderful. It was it was it was it was a learning experience, and we learned how to play cards with him, cause he had all the money, and he would tap the bank. So you might win a couple of hands, but he gonna win the money eventually. We wouldn't play with him no more. That was fun, <laughs> you did. <laughs> so uh, you know, we we went to his studio and. I was I saw Ray 15 years later and, and I gave him a song or something like that. I wrote some songs for him with a gentleman by the name of Billy Osborne who who was with LTD, Jeffrey's brother. So we wrote some songs together for Ray. But my experience with Ray was 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 heartfelt, warm felt, and acknowledging and respecting this this genius of a man. We would be on stage sometimes and it would be the end of the show and Ray would be bowing and stuff, you know. But he'd get close to the stage, you know, the edge of the stage. So we would take turns coming to get him and leading him on you know, back, you know. Then we had, a, I remember one time, my, I was born in Dallas, and we were doing a concert there at one of the big arenas, and they didn't pay Ray his money. So we went on, did our portion of the show. Ray said, we're not going on. Boy, rocks and stuff start flying at that bus. We were ducking. This. It was scary. It was scary. In my hometown, you know. So that was an experience. And then a couple of times, um, one time we were in Pittsburgh. We're getting ready to come back. The tour was over. We're come, getting ready to come back home. So it was just like five or six of us on the plane. We took off from that airport and went up in the air and came down. Ah, skidding and slide. We didn't know what was happening. And the plane finally stopped. And we looked. We got out and we looked down. There's a big gully down there. That was a that was a scary experience on Ray's plane. And we had another couple of incidents, but other than that, man, it was cool. I love Ray. I respect Ray. Wow. Um, where did you get your early influence from in terms of you know what would be your singing style? You know, who did you idolize? Okay. I had an older brother. He was a year and a month older than me. And my brother recorded. He did a song called Hey Senorita with Lynn. The group was called Lynn and Betty. Now, I was gone when he did the recording, but I would hear it on the radio. I said, that's my brother. That's my brother. Now, at home, 
My dad played a little piano. My mom played a little piano. We all played by ear. And then, and then uh, the guys from the church, my daddy's deacon buddies from the church, they would come over and they would jam at the house. And I would every night I'd they drinking beer? You know, that's Reverend such and such. That's Deacon Jones. He's drinking beer, you know. That was funny to us, you know. But so we had a and my aunts and uncles, you know, we had a musical family. So so that's kind of how maybe where I got my little bug. I mean, I didn't plan it, you know, it just happened. But that's where the influence came from. Now, in terms of a style, I think my style, my idol growing up was a, a guy named Ross Barber. And Ross Barber sang with the four freshmen. And I love me some freshmen. So, but I learned, um, you know, in, in a group situation, it's not always about the lead singer, you know, because some guy might look good and he attracts people or a woman might look good, they attract people. So it's about that camaraderie that you have in the group. And I think my, I was blessed, you know, to, to write to Grayson and sing that song, but that was, that was, that was the first thing coming out of the box. But I was more interested in a sound, and we got that sound, you know. So that was my claim to fame: the sound. Mm -hmm. and, sound. And, and how would you describe the LA music scene around that time in the mid to late '60s? What was oh, the vibe like? Oh man, it was it was crazy, and it was thriving, and you know, it was, it was great. I mean, on the Sunset Strip, the Sunset Strip. Maybe even before you got there, uh, okay, I don't know. I don't, but the strip used to be the bomb. You could, you, we used to work at a club called Mr. Contons on the strip, and we worked there five days a week. And uh, it was just the five of us and, and Rex playing the keyboards and singing. But man, you could walk out on the strip this way, that way, clubs, miles from miles, clubs, comedians and jazzers and rock and rollers and stuff. It was, it was wonderful, man. So that so the scene was the scene was good. We um, we let's see, we were rehearsing, and we were we hadn't even had a name yet, and uh, so my roommate was friends with Jim Brown, so Jim Brown was still playing football, so uh, Jim came to town, and like Lamont was a photographer, and he shot all for Jet Magazine, so he shot all, we had all the beautiful girls there. So Jim fell right into that. We was we was rocking and rolling, had all the honeys too. And uh, what's I was forgot what I was gonna say. But anyway, okay, Jim, Jim. So uh one day Jim and I were talking about something. He said, What are you doing, man? I said, Well, I'm putting this group together, blah, blah, blah. He said, What kind of group? And I explained to him. He said, Well, you get it together, and when you get ready for me to see it, I'll come by. I said, Really, Jim? He said, Yeah, yeah. So I told the guys, you know, uh, uh Clarence McDonald and uh, Floyd and, and Jessica and them. I said, hey, Jim Brown is going to come by and went on our rehearsal. Jim comes by. Who he, does he bring with him? Big Bill Russell. So I got to meet Bill Russell, you know. So mm -hmm. anyway, make a long story shorter, Jim liked us. He liked how we sound. He liked the direction. So he became our manager. So he set up this audition or showcase at a place called The Daisy. The Daisy, I don't know if you remember The Daisy, it was in Beverly Hill. But mm -hmm. Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis and all those cats used to hang out there. So we went there and we tore it up. We, we, we threw down, we had a good night. And the next day, I was going to record companies. They weren't auditioning me, I was auditioning them. That's a weird, that's a weird situation. I didn't realize the power that we had. So I'm looking at these, talking to these record companies by myself. Jim wasn't even there. Floyd wasn't. I don't know why I was by myself, but I was there. So uh, we ended up uh, signing with RCA Records. And uh, the reason I like the producer's name was John Flores. He was a staff producer, but he was very low key. And I liked his vibe and he didn't try to BS us or nothing like that, you know. And uh, so we went with, with, with uh, John Flores and RCA Records. And uh, he says, uh, now I got this arranger and his name is Ray Cork Jr. And he's in Phoenix. We'd never heard any of his work. So, so we said, well, <laughs> what are we gonna do? You know, so we, we rolled with it. He turned out to be a, a godsend. You see those arrangements on Grayson and Circles and all? That was Ray Cork, you know, he was, he was the man. This is before we, we hooked up with some other people, but, but I'm, I'll get to that story later. But go on. 
what what uh what songs did you do for your um that spotlight if you remember or the showcase I, I, well we probably did um eli's coming uh going in circles grazing in the grass uh and maybe some cover songs you know you know maybe 45 minutes show so so you already had grazing in the grass by that point i think <laughs> I think, man, maybe, maybe we had a rough, a rough, you know, copy because see, Grayson, when I got hold of it, you, you know the story behind Grayson. Do you know the, the story about it? Well, I know Human Masakela did the music originally, and then the you added lyrics. There you go. Okay, and the yeah. writer, the original writer, his name was Philemon Howe. He passed away also a few years before Huey did. Huey just passed away last year, but um, so I. Uh, I think we did great, and I, I'm not sure, you know. But whatever we did was good enough for, you know, to, to want to sign us. And we had a look, you know. Now, the Fifth Dimension, they were out there already, and they, they kind of inspired us, too. I mean, they were, we're friends. We're friends to this day. As a matter of fact, I had dinner with Marilyn and Billy uh, Sunday. We had, we had sushi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But anyway, so I, maybe people were ready for this, for this, uh, girl guy group sort of a thing and, and, the, and black black guys and stuff singing different types of music. But so, see, actually, I was a black surfer dude from San Diego. So I had all kind of musical influences and so did Floyd. Floyd was from San Diego also. And then Jessica, we, it, was, it was Floyd Butler, Jessica Cleese, Barbara Love, and myself. And I knew Barbara from, from you know, back in the day. But I, Jessica was like 17. And she was, Jessica was, Jessica was a monster. And uh, she had this little uh, clique with Jerry Peters and Anita Poré and Greg Poré and David Crawford. But they were our songwriters. We didn't know, they were young too. So we, you know, we got their career started by singing Going in Circles in Love or Let Me Be Alone. They wrote those songs. So it was like a, a, a little, you know, a mesh, mesh, meshing of the minds. Were groups like... Um... The Mamas and Papas, an influence too, or yeah, yes, yes, you know, guys and girls group, yeah, they were, they, they were, and because like the fifth, they sang like go where you want to go, blah blah blah. That was the Mamas and the Papas, you know that, but they, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was that time for mixed groups, you know, and uh, we just hit it at the. I always say that timing is the name of the game, because if, hey man, I don't care how talented you are, talented you are. I don't care how much money you got. I don't know how cute you are or how muscular. If it's not your time, it ain't going to happen. You know? mm -hmm. So I learned that at an early age. But the stars have to align. I'm sorry. The stars have to align. <laughs> exactly. This is the dawning of Aquarius. <laughs> but anyway, so so we were, we were blessed. And with Jim, Jim was still playing football, but he was making that transition from football to acting. And he was a hot property. So we got with, uh, Jim had a, a, a management company called the BBC. It stood for Brown, Block, and Kobe. Now, you know who Jim is. Uh, the other B was Paul Block. He worked for Rogers and Cowan. Back then it was Roger Cowan and Brenner. And then uh, Richard Kobe was an attorney. So it was BBC. So they kind of handle our stuff. And, and, you know, we had an office on Sunset and stuff. It was, we was rolling. You did. And, and things happened so quick. I mean, I mean, Scott is like, can you imagine this? Like you go in the studio and you walk in the studio and there's a hundred musicians in there. <laughs> I mean, we raved, you know, we had a lot of musicians, but a hundred, you know, the big orchestras and stuff. But we went in there and we did our little thing and, and RCA liked it. And we see Grazing in the Grass was our first, you know, coming out of the box. But when I wrote it, I called it Flaking in the Grass. So uh, I went by the record company, their record company. Uh, I forget his name. I'll think of his name in a minute. But they said, Flaking in the Grass. I get out of here with this stuff. So I said, well, can I use Grazing in the Grass? They said, yes. So after that, it was cool. Because, see, they made money on Hughes Grayson in the grass, and they made money on our Grayson in the grass. So, they, you know, they were, they were happy. Hugh Master Kayla, loved God bless his soul, he was elated. You know, Harry, hey, hey, that's great, Harry, blah, blah, blah. And like I said, the writer's name was Philemon Howe, and he passed away about 10 years ago. I didn't know him that well, but I did meet him. So we made 
us some money and we made a lot of other people some money. Now, as far as the uh, chrono chronology of things, did the Highly Distinct album or the Grazing album come out first? Grazing. Grazing. So, yeah. Grazing. So you did come exploding right out with that yes. um, out of the box. Yes. Were, were you um, – I mean, how much did you know that that was like a hit when you had cut no, it? I had no idea. Had no idea, man. Uh, we did a demo, and it was cool. It was cool. But we didn't have all the background parts or nothing like that. I don't even know if I was finished. But we had no idea. And, and, and I learned, that's something I learned. It's like, you know, you might think, nah, this is hot. This is going to be this. But the audience, they determine what's happening. It's like the song going, you got me going in circles. That was on the B side of another song. They flipped it over and it, you know, it did what it, 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 it did. What it did. So uh, I had no idea. We had no idea. We were, I mean, the first thing out of the box, we were young and crazy and, and we didn't know nothing, man. Well, that song is just so incredibly catchy and the harmonies and the orchestration, the arrangement is just so spot on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was Clarence McDonald. Clarence McDonald was 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 there when we were doing that and doing the music, and uh, we were blessed, man. And then Ray Cork and you know came from Phoenix and did those arrangements and stuff. And like we had, it was funny because we had never met him. If he walked in the room, we wouldn't even know. It. And he, he he came on the road with us and everything. We were, we turned out to be best friends. You know, he's a good guy, good guy. Him and John Foray and RCA. I have good memories. With RCA Records, uh, I don't think they knew exactly what to do with us. You know, number one, because things happened so quick. Number two, you know, RCA was a classical, <laughs> classical label. You know, you know, nah, 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 nah. and then, but you had, um, you had, uh, let me see, uh, Sam was Sam Cook. I think Sam Cook was on RCA. Jesse Belvin was on RCA. So they had some, some, some of the black music, you know, but they didn't, I don't think they really knew what to do with us. Plus the pop department and the, and the R and B department were fighting, <laughs> you know, they, because we crossed over and they didn't know what to do. We said, mm -hmm. huh, cross over. What the hell is that? You cross over the street. We didn't know what the hell they were talking about. But then that's when the politics, you know, we, we go to New York and hang out and that's when we understood the politics. But luckily, <clears throat> excuse me, Jim was there. And he kind of, you know, puts a lot of that stuff to the side that we didn't have to deal with. But later on, I really found out what was happening in terms of the the, uh, the politics that were going on. The gym seems, you know, outwardly and to most people like such a, you know, macho, tough, you know, kind of guy, very serious. Um, I'm guessing that if you really get to know him, he probably has a good sense of humor and all that. What 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 is the real Jim Brown like? The real Jim Brown. Number one, I have to, I have to give you this, this, this disclaimer. We had, we had a fight, and and I lived to talk, <laughs> to talk about. It. We were like, uh, Jim got to had this ego, you know that, you know. But so did they, so did we, you know. We're from San Diego. We wasn't no punks, <laughs> you know. We're from the hood in San Diego, and uh, we were like, there, there's this club in LA. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's called Mavericks Flat. It's on Crenshaw. So Jim had, had something to do with that club later on. But in the meantime, we, we used to hang out there. That's why all the pretty girls would come, and, and we ruled the joint. And uh, we were in the back of Mavericks. We were racing 50-yard dashes and stuff for money. <laughs> so I'm running against Jim, and I don't know if it was somebody else. But anyway, we, won, we ran a 50-yard. I won 49 and three-quarters. By the time he got caught up to me, I was across the line. And I said, man, I won, I won, I won. He said, no, man, you didn't win. Anywhere. And we asked one guy, hey, man, who won? Man, I don't want to get into it. So me, I'll never forget, I had on the Mickey Mouse sweatshirt. And I said, well, man, if it's that important to you, take it was 10 bucks back then, too. You know, I said, well, you take the money. I threw it. <laughs> I threw it in, in the face. And he grabbed me. <laughs> you know, he's choking me and stuff. And, and, uh, he let me go. I said, you're choking me, Jim. And he let me go. And I'm crying by this time, snot running out of my nose. And I, he said, well, you going to get your gun? You going to shoot me? I'm, no, I got in my little car. I went home <laughs> and soaked my neck. You know, he soaked your heart. I soaked my neck. 
And about 45 minutes later, there's a knock on the door. It was Jim. Hey, man, I'm sorry. Blah, 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 blah. Jim bought me my first Cadillac. He gave me the money for my first Cadillac. Jim did have a sense of humor. He had just bought his house up on Sunset Plaza Drive. Jim couldn't swim. And me being a surfer dude, Floyd, too, you know, we could swim. And he, we used to dive and stuff. Jim, can you, how you dive like that? Jim dove, scraped his nose all up. We were laughing and stuff like that. But uh, it, hey, it, was, it was cool. It was cool. You know, uh, I see Jim. I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but I play softball. Uh-oh. You there? Yep. I, I play softball, and I would see him at the Encino Golf Course over there, and we holler and stuff like that, you know. But 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 Jim, Jim, Jim has a subtle, uh, you know, personality, and and then remember, see, Jim was a young man too, like twenty nine or something like that, twenty eight, and he was feeling his oats too, you know. So, but but we we, we got along cool. He, we were he managed us for a few years, you know, and uh, then we kind of went separate ways. So Harry, um, you know, you talked about Fifth Dimension, and we mentioned yes. Mamas and Papas, and the whole kind of mixed uh, group thing. Mm -hmm. So, how did you take steps, or how were you guided, if that was the case, to differentiate what Friends of Distinction would sound like, look like, and be to the public? Okay, number one, we kind of we were kind of like trendsetters ourselves. Yeah, you know, hey, that's what I'm telling you, like it is. We would do commercials and stuff for clothing stores. A lot of people thought we owned the, you remember North Beach Leather? I don't know if you remember that. But we take pictures in their outfits and stuff. So we had a style of our own. It just so happened to be that the fifth had three girl, uh, three guys and, and two girls. And we had two guys and two girls. So, but we didn't, we didn't copy nobody. We did our own thing. We used the same tailor, Harvey Krantz. And everybody in, in, in the music business, Jackson's and everybody, Jim used to get his clothes made there. And, and Harvey kind of, you know, he would, you know, he'd be made clothes for Marvin Gaye. He wouldn't want to make you the same thing, you know. So he kind of he kind of helped us a lot, a lot like that. But just in terms of, of, of trendsetters, we set our own trend. We thought we were. <laughs> was was um, Undisputed Truth kind of Motown's answer to what you guys were doing? Well, say that again. Undisputed truth. I was wondering if oh, that was sort of Motown's answer to what you guys were doing. Real, well, okay. I remember smiling faces. Yeah. Because they were the guy and the girl singing thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Matter of fact, I, they, they were on this radio show the other day. Uh, I, maybe so, man. Maybe, you know, the, 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 the crossover thing happened. Yeah, they were Kirk, Undisputed Truth. They were great. I love those guys. I never met them. You know, I don't think, but I think in answer to your question, yes. Okay. Well, Joe Harris was on a show a while back, so. Oh, that's his name, Joe Harris? Joe Harris was the singer, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, he's, he's cool. Yeah. So, Jessica Cleves, you know, I'm <clears throat> a big fan of because I'm a big uh, Parliament Funkadelic and Earth, Wind, and Fire fan. Okay. So, um, why, why and how did she end up leaving your group? And what, what do you have to say about her? She she passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, you know, great talent and, and, you know, was with such great bands. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Jess, and I didn't lo learn some of this stuff until later, but I don't know if we were on hiatus or, or just chilling, because at one point, you know how you see musical chairs? We had musical girls. You know, like like Barbara, Barbara was married, Barbara was pregnant, and uh, so she had to step aside. And Charlene, we lucky lucked up with Charlene Gibson who sings "Love and Let Me Be Lonely," and uh, she fit, felt, felt, you know, fell right in, in in that slot. And we would tour with her, and then, <coughs> excuse me, and then uh, Barbara had her baby, and came back, and Charlene left. Anyway, during that period. I don't know if Jesse with Jessica was disgruntled or what, but she split. She split. And uh, you know, what you gonna do? We just, you know, got a replacement and kept on stepping. And then Barbara split. And uh, we had to get a replacement for her. Just a moment. And then um 
Jessica and I, we, like we knew Maurice, we Earth, Wind, and Fire. We knew them. You know, we used to smoke a lot of dope together back in the day, and uh, but then we were friends, and uh, Jessica went with them. I didn't even know it. <laughs> I read something about last year somewhere. I said, "Oh, really?" And it's, I don't know. Jim Jim might have suggested it. I don't know, but Jessica was a very talented. Uh, uh, she, Jessica was cool. Jessica was cool. You know, uh, we got along great. And uh, but she just maybe she had growing pains. Maybe she got tired of us. I don't know. You know, her and Jim were an item at one point. I don't know mm -hmm. how much that had to do with it. But uh, then she went with with uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire in Parliament, Pamukadele. And I saw her. The last time I saw her, she wasn't she wasn't doing too good, man. She was so skinny and stuff. And uh, we talked about some royalties, and we got that got that together. And so I'm glad that happened. But uh, other than that, I love Jessica. When she passed away, um, Billy Osborne, you know, LPLTD, uh, he called and told me, saying, hey, "Man, Jess is gone." You know, blah blah blah. And she was scared. She was scared. You know, she, I don't want to go, Billy. I don't want to go. And she, we call it. We don't say dying. We call it catching the bus. <laughs> so she she caught the bus. <laughs> the bus is always running. It doesn't matter who, whose turn it is to get on the bus. But Jessica was cool. I love her and I still miss her. Her family, her family. Her, like, see, Jessica was only like 17 years old also. And she had thick her, her voice was Her voice was somewhat unique, too. Oh, yeah. Four and a half, five octaves. Yeah. You know, and then, and then had bottom to it. So Jessica, uh, hey, Jessica, see, I remember, I'll never forget, we were doing a concert one time in Atlanta. I think it was Atlanta. And uh, we were in town, and Minnie Ripperton was in town. And you know, Minnie got that high voice too. And uh, hey, we were just doing our little thing. And, and, and I found out later nobody came to Minnie's concert. They were all at our concert because of Jessica, that high, that high voice thing, you know. So that was encouraging. But hey, man, we were blessed because you know you have you have a, you have a groups out there, and and maybe you have, they have one lead singer. And if that lead singer goes like Lionel or like Jeffrey Osborne, then the band the band had nobody to fall back on. But we were lucky, man. Everybody <laughs> had a gold, a gold record. Floyd Circles, me, Grayson, Charlene, Melvin, Lovey, Lonely, Jessica, I really hope you do. Barbara, you know, Great Day. And uh, some other girls later on down the line, Diane Jackson and Danny McCormick, they all had gold records, you know? So you could, as long as you had some, a replacement that could come close to that record, we were doing okay. What else do you remember uh, stands out from the experiences of making those first couple of albums? Because I mean, highly distinct, right? I mean that. Yeah. That didn't have a hit single like on Great. it, really, right? Uh, there was one song. On, there was a couple of songs we, you know, turntable hits. You know, just shot it, it turntable hits, but it had a lot of. Um, a lot of pop stuff on it. That's that's what it had. A lot of pop stuff, and so I think that was cool. But see, we were like on the road so much, so we had to run in, record something, go back on the road, maybe go and record something else, and go back on the road. So it was like it wasn't put together. Then we we're doing a tour. I see our first tour out of the box is with Tom Jones, and we were at the Greek Theater for six nights. With Tom, you know, he, Tom was a hot fire cracker then too, you know. So we were recording at the same time and doing these concerts. So that album was, you know, what a piecemeal, you know, no concept, just, you know, song. You like that song? Yeah, we'll do that, blah, blah. Who's gonna sing this? Who's gonna sing that? Grayson was a little bit more planned, you know, because we had time. We knew Ray was gonna, Ray Corp Jr. was gonna do the arrangements, and we had heard some of his. His music and John Flores was there, so that was a little bit more structured. But but uh, the other highly distinct. I mean, it was cool, you know. Uh, but a lot of people like another album we call did called Real Friends. They like that song, so hey, I I, I let it go after that. 